Well, maybe I well maybe I um, I will uh, begin, and my words of introduction will be also for the time for other participants to join. Um, so I, I uh, first um, I'm Sébastien Treyer, I'm the uh, executive director of IDRI, the Institute for Sustainable Development and International Relations, based in Paris. And we are very pleased to uh, have so many uh, participants registering to this uh, important webinar for us. Um, and we are so, so welcome to all the participants and welcome particularly to our two uh, speakers, uh, whom I will present in a, in a minute. Um, I, I, I just wanted to insist on, on a few points as a as way of introduction. First, uh, I wanted to say that it is really very pleased that colleagues and partners in China have accepted uh, to help us think ahead um, and anticipate future scenarios for China, for, for China's economy, uh, for its economic recovery, and also some scenarios about the political space that uh, climate action uh, could find after the crisis uh, in China. Um, I think this is very important uh, for global climate action, uh, of course, because uh, what China does on climate is, of course, uh, scrutinized and, and, and very much uh, uh, interesting for other countries to see how they can also uh, take uh, their climate action forward. But I think uh, I just wanted to stress that this is also particularly important for European countries for European citizens and Europe, European economic actors to understand uh, what's happening now in China. Um, and, and I just want to focus a little bit why this is so important for us now, seen from Europe and other regions from the world. Um, th there are three points I want to mention uh, why we look at China uh, with a lot of attention. Uh, and the three reasons are the following. The first one uh, is that uh, it very obviously China is a few weeks or a few months ahead in managing the crisis. Um, and uh, maybe seen from China, we hope that uh, you are already uh, on the way out of the crisis, uh, exiting the health crisis at least. And you might uh, have perspectives on the issues, challenges or solutions that you see already on the horizon uh, while we at least in Europe, are really stuck in the crisis and all its uncertainties about what it will do to our economies, to our population, and to our capacity to, to see or to anticipate uh, um, new projects for our societies after the crisis. So you're there on the horizon, you see further than we do on the horizon, and in that regard, uh, it's interesting to understand how you see the economic crisis, what it, meant, what it has meant or what it means for the Chinese economy, uh, and also um, how to prevent that the recovery plans uh, bring us back to a carbon intensive uh, economy. That's something that everybody looks, uh, looks at with a lot of attention. And what China is experiencing, what China is doing is of course very inspiring for our own uh, um, aspirations and perspectives in, the, in, 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 our, in our countries. Um, I mentioned it also before, the second reason is that uh, what China does uh, in terms of economic direction uh, is also impactful for the world, given the size of the Chinese uh, markets, its role uh, in the, uh, in the it's, it's central role in our globalized world. Um, and also, I, I can mention it, and, I, and we might discuss that at some point, that there is also a more or less explicit leadership role uh, in global governance that China to some extent takes or has de facto. Uh, and I think that's also why we are so interested in understanding what, uh, how China is dealing with the crisis. Uh, and the last point I wanted to mention, particularly uh, for being now in Europe, uh, what Europe, uh, the third reason why we are so interested is also to understand what Europe and China uh, can or should do together uh, in order for each economic bloc and each political system to come out better of the crisis, uh, because if we cooperate, we're going to do better, that's for sure. But also because Europe and China might have to, I think that's what's something that we want to discuss, also have to collaborate for global cooperation and multilateralism uh, in this moment of crisis. So that's, these are the three reasons why we believe uh, it's very important and why we are so thankful for our two, uh, to our two uh, speakers to have uh, accepted um, to participate. I will present briefly the two um, the, 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 the speakers, and then I will give you some uh, um, 
uh, introduction to how this uh, webinar will function in terms of uh, the, the audience, how you, uh, you will be able to participate. Um, so, um, presenting the, uh, the speakers. First, um, uh, thank you very much, uh, Dong Yue, uh, to have accepted uh, participating. Uh, Dong Yue is a research fellow at Energy Foundation China, uh, one of the key uh, think tanks uh, on the energy transition in China, uh, with whom we collaborate at TV, and we are very uh, happy about that collaboration. Thank you so much for that. Uh, and we have asked uh, Yue to um, uh, give us a first basis of discussion on the perspectives uh, for exiting the crisis, uh, the economic crisis in China, uh, what are the plans from the government side, the priorities that are set by the government, uh, and also how that relates to climate policies, uh, particularly what, we, what could be the, the, Chinese ambi the, the climate ambition in the Chinese uh, NDC, the National Determined Contribution, what are the prospects for the mid-century strategy, the 2050 strategy of China, and, uh, and of course that's linked to the fourth, 14th uh, five-year plan that is due to be uh, published next year, 2021. So there are lots of things that are very important to understand, and of course it's all going to be very prospective, probably more scenarios than just prognosis, um, but that might uh, lead us also to discuss what are the avenues for cooperation or, or mutual learning between China and the EU uh, in those times of uh, exiting the crisis. Um, then uh, we also are very happy to, um, that, that uh, Li Shuo has accepted to, to participate. Li Shuo is a senior global policy advisor, uh, particularly for the issues of climate, biodiversity and ocean at Greenpeace East Asia, based in Beijing. Uh, and Shuo is a, is a very uh, active uh, participant in the nego international negotiations on climate and biodiversity and ocean. And also this uh, a good observer of the, um, the, the, I would say, the political economy of uh, these uh, environmental ambitions uh, within China and how that relates to the international context. And, and Shuo has accepted to give us some insights uh, just after uh, Yue will have presented us the, the basics of the, of the economic uh, um, uh, issues and the climate policy. Uh, Shuo will help us also understand the, 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 the players who are playing uh, different uh, different types of, um, of, of roles uh, uh, for this climate uh, ambition in China and what are the challenges and opportunities. We expect that uh, this introductory part would be uh, uh, around uh, half an hour. Uh, this pre presentation part would be around uh, half an hour, a little bit more probably. And then we will have uh, times for uh, questions and answers. The rule for question and answers is that um, you have uh, in your, um, in your um, on the, on the bottom of your screen, on the Zoom uh, application, you have um, uh, a bar where you have a, a, a number of participants, but also something that is called Q&R for the French version or Q&A for the English version, on which you can uh, uh, click and then uh, ask questions to us. Um, and, that's, um, and that's then the, um, the, uh, the way you can ask us questions. I will play the role of a facilitator, trying to collect, uh, cluster, and uh, transmit your questions to the uh, to the uh, to the speakers. Uh, and thus, uh, we will try to answer as much as possible all your questions. But probably, we will have to uh, pick some of them or or cluster some of them. And that's that's my job. And you're going to have to blame me and not the speakers if your question has not been answered. Uh, and I, I will be definitely sorry for that. Uh, so that's, the, I think, the main uh, uh, messages that I had to, uh, to convey to you. Um, um, and I think uh, now we can proceed. I see just one question saying if there is a, a replay, uh, and I, I will try to answer that question. The, the, we are live on YouTube, uh, and I think that uh, there will probably be a, a video taken that, that uh, could be uh, something that you, that you can uh, answer, that, that you could uh, look at if you don't uh, have the possibility to follow all the whole uh, the whole question. Um, so um, maybe I turn now to um, to uh, Don Yue. Yue, uh, thank you again very much for accepting this uh, difficult task, because I'm sure that the uncertainties are probably smaller than the uncertainties we face in Paris when looking at the crisis. But still, it's very uncertain times. So thank you again for accepting the the idea that you could give us some. Uh, ideas about uh, where, what, how is the situation uh, seen from Beijing? The floor is yours. 
Bonjour à toutes et à tous. Thank you very much, Sébastien. Uh, thank you very much for hosting me and um, for this uh, very uh, important uh, and I'm very honored to be here. Um, and it's uh, quite a pressure to be in front of so many people. But uh, I guess uh, it speaks loudly uh, of the interest of this subject and uh, of um, the well uh, timed uh, discussion that you are proposing here. Um, so I will go uh, very uh, quickly through. Uh, some uh, um, economic impacts and lessons learned uh, in China uh, and for the coronavirus and uh, uh, crisis and how we have been managing this year. Um, we will talk about how to make this uh, the economic stimulus that China is proposing an accelerator actually for climate action and the perspectives uh, for cooperation between EU and China. So I'll try to make it uh, to stay on time uh, China is basically 45 days ahead of European countries in terms of uh, the crisis uh, and um, China in terms of uh, the timing so that everybody gets uh, some ideas, uh, China has reached uh, its thousandth case uh, in, on January 24th and European countries around uh, the beginning of, of March. And so we had uh, several implications of course on health but also on the economy. And uh, China has done a major confinement measures uh, starting um, uh, right after the Chinese holidays, uh, which started on January 25th. So basically the economy started and stopped on January 25th because of the Chinese holidays and never really restarted. And so the workers are really just going back to work right now. So what we can see here is that uh, in China, we had the confinement measures. Uh, maybe at the, at the end of January, and uh, it only started maybe 45 days or some, something like that in European countries, uh, comparing, uh, depending on the countries. But we see very similar uh, figures in terms of number of daily cases and these kind of things. And what you can see a little bit at the end uh, of the China curve is uh, some, um, uh, now what we call imported cases, basically uh, Chinese citizens coming back to China and bringing back the virus but uh, being detected on the way. So I think that uh, we, uh, the first day that China didn't have a domestic case was uh, maybe on March 10 or 11th or something like that. So that gives you an idea. And um, we hope that it can give you some perspective on um, maybe not exactly what's down the road for Europe, but uh, some ideas of uh, at least how um, China has been managing that. And so, um, as you uh, probably, of course, know, that it has been a devastating impact on the Chinese economy, and both on the supply side and the demand side. And so, on the supply side, there was an interruption of the production tools. And you, as you can see, uh, the manufacturing industry, the service industry was heavily impacted. Uh, the, purchase, the purchasing managers index, which gives a confidence index, basically, of um, was uh, down to 35.7%. Uh, so basically 50% means that everything is um, all right and more than 50 is uh, really optimistic. And so 35.7 uh, is really bad. And in the service industry, that was even worse uh, down below 30% uh, in February. The other values that we have are more for January and February in terms of the economy. Uh, so the industrial value added fell 40% uh, for 14% uh, for the the two mounts that was most important for the metals or car industries, as you can see. And the industrial profits fell actually 40% year on year for the first two years. So that's, that's really impactful for the Chinese economy. And one can say that it has been to a stop. To a stop. Uh, on the demand side, of course, as people were home and not moving, there was a very uh, large impact on the consumption and investments, uh, which fell by more than 20% year on year for the first two months. And some experts uh, say that uh, this, uh, only this uh, demand side impact might be as high as 1.5% of GDP. Um, and of course, uh, uh, passenger traffic uh, has been has stopped basically in February and uh, large uh, sales of like automobiles or real estate are really fallen as well. And now what we can see is also uh, an impact on international trade. So China, which is, um, uh, very used to uh, the trade surplus uh, of 42 billion dollars last year, uh, just uh, had uh, to suffer a trade deficit of 7 billion dollars this year. And that alone is almost one, a third of a point of GDP. 
So the impact is, of course, very uh, important. And China has been putting up an economic response uh, accordingly. So in the short term, it's in the short term, it's very much like what the uh, West has been doing: a monetary response to respond to the, uh, I would say, the monetary crunch of uh, people not having any finances or any cash. So lowering interest rate, uh, slashing reserve requirements, and all of that to inject liquidity into the system. The fiscal policies also have been uh, lowered, so taxes and fees have been reduced or suspended. And there has been some general uh, policies about stabilizing employment, and also the more qualitative than something else. And in the medium term, China has been putting up an economic stimulus, so they have announced something to try to restart the economy. And uh, something, uh, what they call it, that is new infrastructure, and so new infrastructure investment in seven sectors, including 5G base stations, ultra high voltage, intercity high speed railway, uh, charging stations for electric vehicles, big data centers, um, uh, big data centers, AI and industrial internet. And we'll, we'll uh, talk more on that later. And there's a further stimulus to come uh, because this is only the beginning. Um, so the activity is now recovering uh, in parts. So uh, the economic, as I mentioned before, is under control for now. And um, it's reported that people are back at work. Uh, I believe it's more than 80%. And uh, the confidence in the service industry is coming back. But there are still many, many unknowns in terms of supply uh, first. So um, are the production capacities really fully back up and are they able to function? So what are the you know, long-term impacts on the companies? Uh, which one uh, are closed? Uh, are the supply chains still here? And in terms of demand, of course, so even if the companies are here to produce, there's no more offer. So will the consumption result under the global pandemic threat? And uh, it's very still and clear uh, of the results of job retention. So will people still have income? And there was no generalized income in some countries in the West. So that's, uh, that's quite a concern. And in terms of policy, uh, how efficient will China's stimulus policies be? Oh, I see that's uh, quite important because I put it twice. And uh, in terms of international uh, trade, so the global economic crash, uh, uh, how will that wait on China's recovery? Um, and will there be, of course, a second phase of coronavirus outbreak in China? Nobody wishes that, but this is quite a risk given the numbers of people coming back to China and being detected uh, with a virus and being quarantined. And so the final impact on China's GDP is far from over and is far from known, but some people have suggested something maybe around 3% instead of the five or to 6% targets that we had. And um, so this is something that I will not venture on, but uh, it's, it's really something uh, that, uh, that's of concern to a lot of people. And so um, I believe that uh, for the civil society and uh, in terms of um, for the climate action and keeping the climate momentum in all of this, there is actually an opportunity to make this economic stimulus. So in this huge amount of money that's coming into, into the economy and uh, that uh, this willingness to do something to, uh, to make action an accelerator for climate action. And uh, so even before the virus, uh, the China's, uh, for maybe decades, uh, China's national storyline uh, has been uh, uh, going into the direction of a low carbon transformation. In terms of economic development, uh, China has uh, seen a higher income level, a higher uh, quality of uh, growth of development, and an overall modernization of its economy. In terms of demographics, as you probably know, um, China is facing an aging middle class, that uh, more demands, demands more safety, health, amenities, education, uh, social and environmental quality. And these kind of the kind of things that uh, the Chinese government will have to answer to. And um, also China needs to upgrade its economic engine too, um, because the catching up can only go so far. And now China needs to really bring its uh, economic engine uh, up, to, up to grade. And so uh, environment and climate issues uh, will, um, actually improve the total factor of productivity of the economy. And um, we have been saying that uh, China needs to bring, building up its human, natural, and social capital, uh, and not only like the industry and the economic part. In terms of geopolitics as well, 
uh, numbers, uh, observers have seen that China has been taking uh, more of a leading role on the global stage and less of a participant. And this is something that the Chinese leadership has also been saying. And uh, we've seen that in terms of biodiversity, of course, uh, with the uh, organization of the biodiversity that, will, that has been postponed and that will now happen in, in Kunming over next year. But as in health, as we've seen in the, in the last few days, but of course, China needs to contribute consistently for the public goods and uh, climate is uh, an important one on the list. So um, we know that the economic stimulus that China is putting on the, in the economy, which will amount to, amount to multiple percents of Chinese GDP, will leave a long lasting impact on China's structure. So how can we make it low carbon? So basically uh, today, uh, we need to make sure that um, this stimulus is consistent with China's uh, trajectory. Uh, we need uh, to uh, make it um, a breakthrough in green and low carbon transition. And we know that we can um, use that to minimize the socioeconomic losses of the epidemic. And we need to build a stronger, resilient economy that's ready for the risks of the future. So if we look at China's new infrastructure, and what uh, they have done, uh, what they have announced, sorry, what they have announced, uh, first look. So there are basically uh, three categories. Uh, the first categories are shovel ready, the green stimulus sectors. And uh, we've, I, we can identify, of course, the electric vehicles charging stations. So that's a great opportunity for local public transportation. And that's a great opportunity for um, vehicle power, uh, uh, vehicle uh, to grid uh, power uh, for air quality improvements, and for the overall attractivity of electric vehicles. But of course, this has been, um, there's some challenges now, uh, given the low price of oil, uh, that uh, increases the attractivity of um, internal combustion engines. And um, there's the second uh, sector, which is intercity high-speed railways, railways. And uh, that would be to accelerate the extension of 4,000 plus kilometers of railway uh, between the cities. And China needs to do also uh, the intracity part uh, on public transport and that should be included. Now there's a second part of more neutral uh, infrastructures, uh, should I say, that's more on the digital side, so 5G, uh, 5G base stations, big data, uh, artificial intelligence, and industrial internet. We see that as opportunities for high efficiency for the economy. Uh, for advances maybe in the shared economy, for synergies uh, possibly with the power and energy sector. But also we need to um, uh, be vigilant in terms of energy consumption, energy efficiency, as um, we know that the digital economy has been a large contributor, a sig very significant contributor of the increase of uh, power consumption in China. And um, the point of vigilance actually is ultra high voltage power transport lines. And um, if we see that as part of a broader reform of the energy system for higher integration of renewables, of course, that's very positive. Uh, but uh, we need to move um, both on the infrastructure, the policies and the market mechanisms. But it cannot be uh, uh, um, something that introduces more coal fired power plants on the line. So China will probably have more and more economic responses and economic stimulus down the line. Um, you know, one of the reasons is because uh, that stimulus was announced in the beginning of March before the global ep ep epidemic and before the, the global impact on the economy. So other sectors uh, actually in the low carbon economy are shovel ready. So we can do them right now and they will be very efficient to inject money and employment in the economy such as them are um, deploying renewable energies, uh, for example, in the cities, uh, building insulation, high energy efficiency appliances on heating, on cooking, on cooling, uh, low carbon industry development. That's more uh, in the long term, but it is something that we need to start right now. And of course, adaptation and resilience to climate change and land use, water pollution, agricultural practices, something that China has a lot of improvement potential on. And so, uh, in the long run, environmental safety, climate, health, and social resilience, they should become core metrics of uh, China's success and of its uh, leaders, and not just uh, China's GDP. And this is something that um, they, they have to, uh, to realize now and change the state of mind. Um, China needs to um, 
avoid the carbon intensive lock-ins, and they will be detrimental to China's economic recovery. So uh, traditional carbon intensive investments, they are not profitable in the long term. They will need to be retired early and uh, they will delay China's modernization. They will constitute stranded assets, just like the overcapacities from 2008 that China has been suffering from. And, and they will enlarge actually the rift between the carbon dependent provinces and regions and the more modern cities, which are more acquainted with uh, clean air and uh, uh, clean climate. And that will degrade China's inequalities and um, you know, increase the issues of internal migrations. And of course, uh, um, on the geopolitical side, that will distance China from the rest of the world. So it's something that um, needs to be done. And it's not only uh, like economic investments and money thrown into the economy. And we also need policies and regulations and stronger institutions. And to make that last in the long term and give incentives, not only in the public sector or the, in the sectors where the money is poured, but also in the private sector and to change people's behavior. So of course, on the, on the list, I won't go too much into the details. We have efficient carbon pricing. We need benchmarks and, and emission performance standards. Uh, we need more transparency, more MRV. Uh, we need to phase out fossil fuel subsidies. I think that's something that's where we have a very good opportunity to do so because our prices are low. And we need domestic signals, strong signals. And China's 14th five-year plan could be a big one. And uh, we need global political signals to also bring leadership, uh, to take leadership and bring other countries in the world and China's NDC could be a way to do so. The net zero commitments for the long-term strategy could be a way to do so. Still, there are some challenges on the way. And one of them is, um, some, those challenges are actually not really limited to China. So um, sharing the cost among the actors of society. At the end of all that, we'll have a high level of debt all over the world and a lot of internal generational burden. We need to talk about that. And we need to avoid austerity measures that will just in, increase the inequalities and uh, go in the opposite way of resilience. Um, we need some availability. Uh, there's an issue around the availability of private capital uh, when companies don't have the money because they don't have the, uh, the orders, then they, will have very, um, they won't have much to invest in low carbon technologies and deployment will take longer. And um, it's, it's, that's something that's very difficult to, to go against, but uh, strong public support and public, um, uh, uh, and public uh, commands orders. Uh, uh, public commands would actually be uh, a way to do that. Um, we need more private accountability. So we will uh, pull a lot of money into the, into the economy and massive corporate bailouts are uh, sometimes inevitable uh, and sometimes they're justified but we need environmental accountability uh, so that uh, the, the direction lasts. Uh, maybe the state can take some equity share. Maybe we need some environmental conditionality to the bailout. And one difficult issue that uh, China will be facing and that uh, I know that European countries are also facing is reaching as there is a pool on carbon dependent regions in the world. So they are the hardest to reach with uh, green projects. And so uh, we need to uh, think extra um, extraordinary about uh, inclusiveness to avoid social injustice and further alienation of those climate topics. And so now for some perspectives um, on cooperation between you and China. So we have to know that on the bottom line, you and China share a vision uh, of the long term. So uh, the European climate neutrality uh, vision and China's ecological civilization vision actually share a lot of in, in, in common in terms of climate, in terms of air quality, in terms of quality of life overall. And from China, we, are, we see a lot of interest uh, into the EU Green Deal. Uh, the EU Green Deal is seen as a comprehensive economic stimulus and the restructuration plan of the EU to achieve its transformation. Uh, and, and the Chinese new infrastructure investments uh, is a very good starting point to discuss. Uh, between the EU and China on how to move those together. And even if, if we're starting from different places, there's a lot of common concerns. So the long-term economic benefits, how can we turn, turn them into immediate action? 
um, there is of course common concerns on health, air quality, and environmental safety. Um, there's some issues on transforming the energy, the industry, the transportation, housing, and consumption sector. So that's all of that is quite difficult. Um, and a fair transition is an important point, of course. Um, policy dialogue. So what can we talk to? Uh, what can we start to talk uh, between um, EU and China? Uh, China needs. Uh, we have been very interested into the EU taxonomy of economic activities, and we need an urgent dialogue on that uh, to try to look at uh, at how to classify from an climate but also an economic point of view the different economic activities and um, give a, a strong direction for uh, public and private investments. We need a discussion on resilience uh, that could be done at a multilateral level under the G20 or under the coalition of finance ministers for climate action, actually uh, and the, under the social protection discussions under the IMF. So there's a lot of places to talk about this. And we need to share a strategy. Why do we need to share a strategy? Because eco coordinated economic responses will be more efficient because we need to align on a shared vision for trade. So especially uh, now that we will pour a lot of money into the economy and a lot of state aids, what will trade look after that, uh, look like after that? And we need to rebuild global value chains in a more climate friendly way. And of course, the social, financial, and fiscal accountability of the private sector is something that could be put into, uh, that we should question at this moment for improved resilience in the future. We need to pursue together uh, in integrated health, economic, and climate, and environmental cooperation. So basically, there's been almost no multilateral cooperation so far. We, we've seen some bilateral cooperation on the health issue but nothing from the more lateral side. And I think we need uh, stronger institutions. Uh, we need to go back to the spirit after the World War II, where the UN was founded, where the WHO, the Bread and Woods Institutions, the European Project were founded. And uh, we believe that together we can seize this occasion to build resilience and adaptation frameworks with a shared priority on social protection and climate action. And finally, this crisis shows the destruction of the ecological system and the limits of the planet. Uh, I believe our response needs to globally integrate everything from climate, biodiversity, and health. And um, to do that, where we can start with is to pursue the political level cooperation between climate and biodiversity. It was done in Beijing by President Macron and President Xi Jinping in the follow-up uh, at the Beijing call for biodiversity conservation and climate change. And in the end, what's the impact on global climate momentum? Um, that's something that's very much uh, in, this, uh, in, the, in the spirit of this uh, seminar and it's something that's a lot of question about. But as the first country to come back from the crisis, China will set the tone for how the economic stimulus and the climate agenda moves together or actually are quite independent. And uh, despite obvious health emergency that you have to take uh, for. I think you should engage the dialogue with China as soon as possible. And uh, EU's Green Deal could be a basis for this dialogue. Um, it could leverage and anchor the expectations of China. And you and China could show strength in multilateralism to form new institutions and also help third, third countries that are not able to help on, uh, on health, on um, climate and on environment. So just to conclude and wrap up, I'll just give back some uh, global ideas uh, that I mentioned during this presentation. The stimulus package will spend several percent of the GDP, of the global GDP. And we know that climate money spent now is actually um, um, saves cost uh, from later. Uh, so that's actually a great investment and it's something that we need to invest in. The great stimulus is very attractive in the language of economists, and we need to speak the language of economists. So uh, something that's green and similar, uh, the, the green uh, low carbon economy builds new growth engines. It avoids risks of stranded assets. Uh, it, uh, climate transformation projects are shovel ready and they will deliver the jobs. And this is something that we need today. And structural transformation 
uh, for social economic resilience is something that we have to look for in the long term. EU and China has a lot of organic cooperation to, uh, to, to, to build on and the green recovery will help um, to, apply, to align the global supply chains and uh, it might actually avoid returning to trade conflicts later. And in the meantime, if I may help save the planet, then it's all for the better. Thank you very much. Back to you, Sebastian. Yes, thank you very much, Yue. Uh, that was very, uh, very useful. Um, and, and I just wanted to, uh, I'm not going to share with you the questions that I've gathered, but uh, I think what is, some of the questions are about the fact that uh, you rightfully point at all the opportunities that we have uh, and the, the things that are already in, play, in place by, in the visions of the, gov the Chinese government. Uh, but some, uh, some of the, of the uh, participants are asking, this is what should happen. Uh, do we have a prospect about what might or will happen in terms of uh, other players uh, bringing the, 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 the economic stimulus towards uh, more carbon intensive sectors? Uh, and I, we will come back to that in the, in the discussion. But I believe one of the points of also listening to uh, Li Shuo was also to have his understanding of who are the, who are the different players and what, what in, in, his, uh, in his vision, what are the, uh, the, the challenges and, and opportunities, particularly to see how this uh, Avenue that you, the, the roadmap that you've set uh, set up uh, here very clearly, uh, UA, how this is going to be possible, and what are the resistances that might be that we might be facing. So, Shuo, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Bonsoir. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Sebastian, and also thanks to your colleagues uh, for uh, the invitation. It's it's very good to see such a big crowd uh, this evening uh, and amongst the crowd, uh, a lot of uh, uh, friends and colleagues. Uh, in light of the, uh, the very comprehensive presentation from Dr. Dong Yue, uh, let me just uh, be, try to be very brief um, by uh, uh, communicating three points. Um, and hopefully these three points can answer your questions, Sebastian, and also uh, tee up our further conversation. My first point is just to contextualize on uh, China's climate politics, uh, to kind of put um, China's, climate po uh, China's climate politics in, uh, in, a, in a longer uh, time frame. Um, as um, many of the participants know, um, China was a major contributor to uh, the Paris Climate Accord. Um, and you know, in, in, in contributing uh, to uh, the, the, the Paris Climate Summit, China also managed to transform its, its international image from a la laggard not a very long time ago in Copenhagen to uh, you know, a very active uh, player when it comes to international climate diplomacy. Uh, and in this, uh, in this process, uh, China has also shown politically, for example, some uh, flexibility when it comes to uh, you know, very uh, important issues such as common but differentiated responsibilities, um, and transparency. Um, I think one thing to uh, note here is um, um, China's climate uh, transformation uh, in the middle of the last decade was very much backed up by rather robust economic uh, development. Uh, well, at the same time, a rather slow energy, particularly coal consumption. Uh, in, uh, for example, the years between 2013 and 2016. Um, this climate momentum uh, largely sustained after Paris until 2018 and 2019. Uh, but since then, um, a number of key uh, political and economic factors uh, have changed. Uh, on the economic side, China's economy overall uh, is, is cooling down, is slowing down. Uh, and that uh, you know raises uh, uh, you know employment concerns and other other concerns. China's coal consumption has also been bouncing back uh, over the past two to three years. Uh, as we all know, uh, China now uh, is is in a very difficult. Some some people would characterize this as a systematic confrontation uh, with the United States. Uh, and in the meantime, uh, low climate ambition from elsewhere in the world. Um, you know, does not necessarily uh, contribute to uh, higher 
climate ambition in China. So let me just conclude my first point um, by saying uh, before COVID-19 hit us, um, dark clouds were already hovering above us in terms of uh, China's climate politics. Let me shift to uh, my second point, which is about uh, the challenges. And I, I, I don't want to duplicate what Dr. Dongyu has already said. Um, so, so let me just quickly say politically what COVID-19 means is that in the short to medium term, um, the, the attention uh, of the Chinese leaders will very much be on coming down of potential further outbreak and also uh, you know, try to revive China's economy. And this will leave uh, less uh, political and, 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 and diplomatic space for uh, the, uh, the environmental agenda. Economically, as Dongyue has already shown, uh, we are experiencing indeed a, a, a very unprecedented uh, you know, economic um, uh, situation. Uh, we just registered, for example, the worst uh, industrial performance, and unemployment figures. Uh, again, this, this, this took place in a country uh, with a very uh, rapid development story for the past three decades. So this is, this is really, really unprecedented uh, for, um, for many of us here in China. And diplomatically, uh, COVID-19 hit us, I think, uh, you know, at, uh, at, a, at a critical junction when um, international trust is um, pretty low. Um, and uh, we, we also did not see much hesitation uh, from, uh, from all sides uh, to engage in a, in, a, in, a, in a game of finger pointing related to uh, COVID-19. Um, and, and more fundamentally, I think the bad diplomacy that we, we saw uh, in, in, in a few different places in the world over the past one month is a reflection of the domestic problems and challenges uh, you know, of, of, of different countries. Let me, let me conclude with my third point, which is about opportunities. Um, and I, I, have, I have three very brief ones. Uh, the first one is uh, as a result of COVID-19, uh, I think the idea of health, both human health, but also planet health, the idea of resilience, both um, you know, economic resilience, but also environmental resilience. The idea of sustainable development, international cooperation, multilateralism will be better recognized by both the, the, the global public, but also politicians. Um, and, and I just want to note that these concepts or these ideas um, are indeed very critical in, you know, ingredients for better uh, you know, global climate uh, cooperation. Uh, my second positive or, 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 or opportunity uh, has already been mentioned by Dong Yue, which is uh, in the Chinese contact uh, from very early on, uh, when we talk about reviving the economy, uh, the, the so-called new infrastructure uh, you know, was put on the table. Um, and I, I think this indeed represents an opportunity to upgrade China's economy. Um, we should not un underestimate the impact uh, when uh, you know uh, the factory of the world is is, is transitioning to to embrace uh, higher end growth, uh, and also uh, I think here uh, people will realize uh, the significance of this. Uh, if we recall what happened uh, more than ten years ago uh, at the global financial crisis in 2008 and 2009, back then um, the Chinese policy makers really didn't have so many good alternatives but to embrace conventional infrastructure. And as a result of that, there was a huge round of infrastructure build up uh, and you know, uh, emissions, both air pollution and also greenhouse gas emissions as a result of that. So uh, in a way, China is in a better uh, position now compared to 12 years ago. Lastly, uh, I think the, um, the nature or conservation agenda, this is related, this is not an, a, exactly the climate agenda, but it is a very interconnected piece uh, to uh, climate change. Uh, nature agenda, I think, I think we will see some opportunities there. Um, 
as we all know, uh, COVID-19 is very likely triggered uh, by uh, the interaction between wild animal, wildlife, uh, and, and humans. Um, and as a result of that, there has already been a very vibrant uh, domestic debate these days in China uh, to uh, tighten our wildlife management uh, system. Uh, we are ex you know, expecting uh, our wildlife protection law to be a mandate, hopefully within this year. And China will also host uh, a uh, landmark and, you know, uh, uh, a COP uh, for the Convention on Biological Diversity uh, next year. So I, I, I think, I think this, this will be, I think going forward, a rather promising uh, field uh, and, and this can also be connected back to the global climate agenda. Let me let me just uh, uh, leave it here uh, and turn it back to Sebastian again. Thanks very much for inviting me, and I look forward to the uh, to the Q and A. Well, thank you very much, uh, Shuo. Thank you very much, uh, Yue. Uh, I see lots of uh, messages to say thank you for the presentations. Um, I, I will try to uh, cluster uh, the questions that I saw in the different uh, in, the, in different types of clusters. There is one cluster about um, what is actually the the, the, the the Chinese government doing today, um, and I will go into details. But it's about um, um, these new infrastructures uh, priorities that you've given uh, uh, Yue. To what extent? Uh, is it becoming real, really funded? And there are uh, specific questions, particularly on the energy sector, uh, balancing both the, uh, so the low prices of oil, uh, the energy security questions, and the coal sector. So, so I, I will come back to that in more detail, but that's the first cluster. There is a second cluster that uh, revolves around uh, new uh, other ideas about uh, how, how the, 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 the economic stimulus could be changing. Uh, questions around, for instance, uh, the, the prospects for circular economy, uh, prospects about better integrating uh, G, uh, the other factors into GDP, but also on the demand side, um, the, 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 what is the consumer sensitivity to ecological issues? So can we also bet that on the demand side there will be something? I have a, a third cluster that is really about um, uh, the issue of resilience, and I think you answered some of them while speaking, uh, you particularly, about well, what do you mean by a resilient economy? Is that an issue? Is that a concept currently discussed? But particularly the issue of social resilience. I, I think the social dimension and even the, uh, the psychological dimension uh, behind the, the trauma that the crisis uh, represents is something that was of interest for, for, for the, uh, the participants. And then my last cluster is about uh, international cooperation, particularly between EU and China, uh, but, uh, and also uh, at, a, at a global scale, uh, trying to think also of Africa. And one of the key questions behind that, I, I will come back to that, to that cluster again, but it's also, um, is there, a, we see in Europe a lot of demand for deglobalization or changing the organization of globalization for uh, re gaining back uh, supply chains uh, with more production in Europe and not only uh, delocalized in other regions. Uh, what is the vision, of, what, what would you say is the vision about globalization to in China because it's been the engine of the poverty reduction in China. So that makes a lot of questions. Um, I, we, we still have uh, 40 minutes uh, and I would like to, um, to, to, to go first for the, 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 my first cluster and I, I, I will maybe something that uh, I think you 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 uh, expressed very uh, very well, uh, Yue, but I want to 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 uh, reemphasize it. What uh, you presented under the new infrastructures is actually the priority given by the uh, Chinese government for the recovery package, saying we need to go in that direction. So it's an official direction. But then the questions were: uh, Are the policymakers really interested uh, beyond the, the official statement? Do you see that this is something that is really there is an ownership by policymakers? Uh, in China of that new infrastructure's direction or the, green, the greening of the stimulus or the new, new, uh, new direction given to the, uh, the recovery package. Um, there, is, there is also a question about, could you have, uh, do you have already some ideas of the, uh, the share of the amounts, particularly for the, uh, what you call the, 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 
the, the, the category of these investments that are definitely green on electric vehicles and rail transport, is that a big share, a small share? Do you see if there is a competition between the different possibilities? There are lots of questions about the 5G. Uh, why do you say it's neutral? Uh, some of the participants say it's known to be actually bad for the environment. Uh, maybe that's something that you might uh, want to discuss upon. Um, and, and some questions also about the bailout and the issue of envi environmental accountability that you've mentioned. What, what would it mean, uh, that idea of an environmental accountability, that it, would that be a condition for the bailouts? Um, I'm, I'm still in the same cluster. Uh, I, I, I named them, but then please, uh, uh, UA and, and Schwab, uh, pick the one that you, that you are really comfortable to, to deal with or the way you want. There is a focus on the energy sector. Uh, lots of people uh, like myself have seen that uh, coal has uh, gained interest uh, uh, in, in this situation. Some of the participants mentioned that the former stimulus package uh, after former crisis have actually generally led to an increase in energy use and in emissions. So how to understand that the situation would be better today in that regard, particularly when there are also issues of energy security uh, and with a very low oil price, uh, we could imagine very well that uh, China actually uh, goes for coal and oil. Uh, and so, so how do, do you, would you be able to give us a little bit of insight of the political economy in the energy sector? So that's a lot of questions already. But that's the first cluster on what is the reality or what could you be saying of the risks and, and opportunities of the, the reality behind the, all the, the, the roadmap that you've been uh, presenting um, uh, UA. And I know that Shu already has been uh, giving his, uh, his um, uh, vision of the risks and opportunities, but you might also have uh, uh, some, some things to say on, the, on that first cluster. Please, uh, maybe Yue, would you want to go first? Um, okay, that's that's really a lot of questions, and um, it's good to see the interest. But uh, unfortunately, there's just so much we don't know yet. And um, so uh, I think that overall, uh, these uh, new infrastructures are something that have been announced, and that's something that's uh, official. That's something that people will go to. And in China, when there's a public announcement in this kind, uh, it has uh, impacts uh, in the real economy. Mm, however, the details of it are very much in the making right now. And so that's why uh, we believe that it's uh, also more important to have a dialogue between the EU and China on um, all of these issues of environmental accountability, on uh, uh, environmental integrity, uh, on the conditions under which uh, those investments should be made. And um, as we say, the devil, and the devil is in the details and we need to uh, go into how uh, for example, the 5G network uh, could be implemented uh, in um, uh, rather uh, carbon uh, climate friendly way. And um, we believe that, uh, as Lishu said, uh, uh, it's already a, a good sign in some way that China is going into these new investments, uh, new infrastructure investments. And so um, there is a recognition that uh, the 2008 response uh, uh, created a lot of overcapacities and a lot of um, uh, carbon locking, uh, and uh, which are not um, um, inefficient. And uh, I believe that uh, also um, in Europe and globally in, in the world, we should be caring for uh, the climate impacts of um, all of those things uh, in order to talk to China and be convincing. Uh, we need to uh, to talk on the economic aspects of it, and uh, we need uh, to um, build a strong narrative uh, that uh, climate friendly uh, uh, economy is actually better in terms of profitability, in terms of uh, economic advantages, in terms of jobs, of uh, social integration, and um, this is something that uh, uh, we need to uh, adapt to in order to be convincing, in order to be efficient. And um, we feel that uh, it's, uh, it's uh, just like mentioned, uh, Lisa mentioned earlier, we have uh, a very difficult uh, uh, background uh, to talk about climate action in China uh, on the NDC and uh, even on the long-term strategy. Uh, they, the, the people in charge of the topics uh, have been working and uh, have been doing some uh, um, 
very good studies and uh, impact assessments and these kind of things. However, the political decision is uh, very much uncertain. And so, and we know that now uh, the political attention, the focus of the, uh, the political leaders and the decision makers are um, unfortunately more on the economy than on climate. And so that's uh, the language we need to talk to. Thank you very much. Luis, would you want to uh, complement that? Sure, uh, happy to. And, and, and sorry, uh, I, I turned off my, my camera just to save some bandwidth. I, I hope that's understandable with your your participants. Uh, no let me let me yeah, yeah let, let me make uh, make one thing very uh, clearly with uh, with the participants. Um, the, the the Chinese government, indeed, as as Dong Yue has already said, um, there there there. Uh, uh, there is still a lot of unknown there. Uh, and the reason, one of the reasons to that is the Chinese government has so far been fairly restrained in terms of throwing easy investment and easy credits into the market. Um, again, this is, uh, this is a very significant uh, difference compared to 12 years ago uh, when there was you know, an astronomical Four trillion uh, RMB stimulus package, uh, you know that 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 the government introduced uh, into the market. So one way to answer uh, some of the questions from your participants is: so far, uh, the priority from the regulators have been on um, helping uh, the poor community, small businesses, focusing on a, a you know uh, restarting production. Um, and I think another way to answer uh, some of the questions in the in the in the first cluster is um, uh, we say in China there has been for the past few uh, two decades a trika in driving China's economic growth, and this trika, uh, you know, of course has three components: investment, trade, and consumption. Um, so when we talk about a stimulus package in uh, the conventional sense, what we are referring to is primarily the investment component. Um, and, and, and as I said, on this component, there hasn't been a lot of uh, clear uh, policies from the government. Uh, aside from, uh, from the central government, uh, very favorable rhetoric to new infrastructure. Uh, when we look at trade, uh, I think this is this is going to be an interesting area, as everybody knows. Trade, you know, China is 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 the global merchant, right? China China imports a lot of stuff and exports a lot of stuff. Uh, one interesting anecdote uh, over the past one month here in China is uh, a lot of our export oriented industries um, uh, have spent the past two months busy with one thing, which is to get their supply. Uh, uh, to get their supply chain right and to get their laborers back to work. Uh, but as soon as they manage to do that, uh, a new challenge now is in front of them, which is they don't have many orders from Europe uh, and the United States and as well as other parts of the world. So I think a lot of uncertainty and those are a lot of challenges on the trade uh, component of the trika. And in terms of consumption, um, you know, the general trend is China needs to rely more and more on consumption to drive growth. Uh, and here, I think a very important uh, issue is how do we make, uh, you know, uh, China's future consumption more sustainable and greener. Uh, let me just say one thing on the, on the 5G and, and, uh, and uh, uh, its, its carbon footprint. Uh, I think it is indeed a very genuine concern. Uh, on to what extent uh, you know 5G could be green, uh, I think a large part of it will depend on the source of energy for China's data centers. Uh, and as Greenpeace, we actually just did a very recent report on this particular topic, the carbon footprint of China's data center. This uh, is increasingly becoming uh, an emerging source of China's uh, emission growth. Uh, and, and of course, uh, given that China's energy system is primarily coal-based, uh, uh, there, 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 you know, uh, needs to be uh, some scrutiny, but also some opportunities uh, if the IT companies 
uh, can truly em embrace the low carbon concept. With regard to coal, very lastly, uh, le let me just say uh, that um, maybe a bit contrary to the conventional wisdom, uh, the problem that we have in China is not really to what extent COVID-19 will trigger uh, additional build up, you know, build up. Uh, and the reason that I'm saying this is because before COVID-19 hit us, China has already managed to have a huge pipeline of new coal-fired power plants, 200 gigawatt of them in various stages of construction and planning. So the real question is what will happen to this 200 gigawatt? Uh, and I think it's, it, it, it is to some extent fair to say that um, uh, uh, COVID-19 will make halting uh, the materialization of some of these projects more difficult than before. And very quickly, before this 200 gigawatt and before COVID-19, our existing coal capacity has been running on about 40 to 50% in terms of their uh, you know, load factor. So we have already, in other words, we have already got more coal capacity than we need. Um, again, this is one case in point, which goes back to 2008, the overcapacity the stimulus package created for us. We are in a way still dealing with that aftermath. Thank you very much to both. I, I think um, I, I see other questions that are actually uh, uh, trying to uh, have you get uh, to, to ask you more directly. What are your prospects for the Chinese NDC, the 15th four-year plan, uh, and, the, and the, 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 the space for climate action in the 14th uh, five-year plan, uh, and the mid-century uh, mid strategy? The, the, maybe you could answer either through a, a question, uh, an answer on, on the timing, or the, so it's, it's probably difficult for you to uh, forecast what is actually going to happen. But how do you see the, the, the capacity of uh, China to take an ambitious NDC uh, to put it to put climate action really uh, central to the 14th four year five year plan and and uh, the issue of the 2050 mid century strategy. Do you have anything to say about what what is what we can imagine based on on the challenges and opportunities that you uh, both uh, uh, focused on? Shuo, would you like to go first? Sure. Uh... Let, let me maybe take one step back um, because you know when we talk about NDC, in my mind, it, it is really you know one very concrete policy instrument when it comes to international climate cooperation. Uh, so I think first of all, we, we really need to talk about um, after COVID-19, how do we revamp international climate cooperation? Uh, I, I, I really enjoyed one slide uh, from, from Dong Yue, which is, this, this analogy to kind of designing a, a, a post war War II uh, war order. Uh, I, I, I think to some extent we, you know, we, we, we might find you know analogy uh, in 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 that. Um, and uh, I, I I I think in a way COVID nineteen will be uh, a critical opportunity for us to reimagine things, both the economic order. Uh, but also uh, the global uh, institutions. Uh, and I think there's also an urgent need to build a global uh, environmental narrative. Um, one interesting thing is indeed COVID-19 is a result of the imbalance between human and the environment. So to redesign, rebuild uh, the, the new world post you know, COVID-19, we should, we, we ought to start from the environmental aspect. Uh, so with, with that in mind, a few, a few concrete things to say on, on the NDC, we, you know, we understand that um, there, there have been proposals and options prepared by the Chinese government. Um, and of course, you know, COVID-19 introduces uh, a, a profound, uh, you know, uh, uncertainty factor now uh, into, into the system. Um, but, you know, I, I assume there will be um, some interministerial uh, consultations on China's NDC in the next few months. Uh, and at some point, a political decision uh, needs, to be, needs to be made. Uh, 
I think that the very important point amidst all the uncertainties here is that um, an NDC enhancement in our view would align very well with the new direction that China's economy needs to go. It aligns very well with you know, the visions uh, that are captured in the new infrastructure narrative. So, so I think there will be some synergy there and politically we should really leverage that synergy. Thanks a lot. You do you want to complement that? Mm, yeah, I think uh, I fully agree with what Lee Schroeder said. And maybe just to give um, a little bit compliments, we, we, we really feel that uh, China is in capacity to, uh, in, I believe in technical capacity to enhance its NDC and to achieve an enhanced NDC. So um, it's way on the path to achieve its current one. And um, uh, Energy Foundation has been coming up with uh, proposals for targets uh, that uh, are more ambitious and yet realistic. Uh, we believe there's room for, uh, for, for really improvement in the NDC. However, uh, the political willingness or the political um, attention that uh, this sensitive subject can grasp is limited under the, circun uh, the current circumstances and even before that. And um, so I think that uh, there's a there's a there's, there's really uh, that's really a challenging thing because we need that at the global level. We need global leadership. Uh, we would ideally lead, uh, need an uh, EU-China uh, coalition for our ambition. Um, and uh, if we are just a, a wish uh, going for wishful thinking, we need uh, Democrats maybe also on the American side to push for. For, for for something uh, in 2021, uh, but uh, in terms of uh, what China, uh, what kind of new opportunities also open? I think that uh, these new infrastructures and uh, this idea of um, proposing uh, a stimulus that uh, uh, there is something to do here, and if we can work with the Chinese and uh, I mean we in the sense of the international community and the Europeans uh, if we can um, make that uh, stimulus uh, something that's uh, going into the, the right direction uh, it will uh, it will bring a strong contribution of China uh, in, in, in Glasgow and uh, it might not be in the form of uh, the, the conventional NDC and it might not be something that's um, that falls under the category of the NDC. But if China is able to do, make investments that are going into the right direction, that are putting climate action um, uh, for the next decades, uh, that's something that's uh, definitely uh, worth uh, trying. And so even if it does not um, uh, an improvement of the numbers of the China's current NDC, it's something that uh, we should definitely aim for. Uh, the long-term strategy is something that uh, may be politically less sensitive because it's more in the long term. And uh, I've also seen that uh, probably in Europe, the, the debate on the long-term strategy is easier than the discussion on the NDC. Um, but um, uh, yet, uh, it, is, uh, it is something that uh, remains sensitive and uh, where there's just a lot of unknown. As Lishwa said, it really will depend on how we come out of this crisis. And if we are able to maybe gather some energy around the whole issue of health, biodiversity, and climate together. Yeah. There is one, uh, one question, this, uh, probably quite short, uh, one question asking, can we expect something about climate ambition by China on NDC or mid-century strategy, mid strategy before the US election? And I... I believe that's, that's not what you were saying, but probably because the COP is postponed, the 14th five-year plan is next year, we should not expect something before the US election. Uh, am I wrong? Uh, uh, Lishu can probably compliment more than me, um, but, uh, after, after me, but I believe, so the, the 14th five-year plan is planning will be, the, the large part of the decisions will be taking this year. And so, uh, we will see some signs uh, on the direction, the general direction. Um, in terms of what uh, it will, China will come up with on the international level, this is uh, something that, yes, I, I would say it's more unlikely now. 
and China will come out with something uh, before the US election. Yeah, uh, sorry, Sebastian, you're, you're breaking up a bit, but let me, let me just say one, one very quick thing here. Um, it, domestically, there is a very, very politically significant uh, target, uh, which uh, is, is, is under a heated discussion or debate in China, which is uh, the annual GDP growth figure for this year. Um, there, and, and, and the domestic discussion, of course, is uh, number one, should we still set that figure at all? Uh, and if so, number two, what should that figure be? Should it still stick to 6%, which, uh, you know, has been the, the, the original idea, or should the government lower it down? Uh, I want to mention this uh, bec because, number one, um, that target will be uh, uh, released at some point this year, um, and it will have huge implications in terms of what the Chinese government will do, including uh, what type of stimulus package will, will, will the authorities throw into the market? Uh, but also number two, uh, just to illustrate the level of uncertainty ahead of us, uh, such a important politically significant figure hasn't been decided by China. So we, we may probably allow some more time for you know, uh, uh, issues such as NDC and, and the long-term strategy. We, we may need s some more time to get better clarity uh, on, 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 those, on those issues. Thank you very much. I, I wanted to take maybe five minutes on, on other issues uh, concerning the, uh, this uh, green uh, recovery, the capacity of the recovery and, and the, the next uh, of the, uh, the, the modernization plan that you're talking about, that, that this should be green more from the, 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 the side of the, 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 the demand or the needs of citizens. Um, that there were lots of questions about uh, what is the consumer demand for something that would be more ecological. There is also a lot of questions about social resilience and the social needs. And I connect that to one question that is about uh, targeting particularly SMEs, uh, employment in SMEs. Uh, is that something that is particularly uh, intended? And what you understand of also the debate on making the the, the, this modernization being really targeted at social employment, uh, entering a social needs. Uh, and I think, and, and another part is also, uh, uh, could you be, uh, could you, uh, I think uh, uh, Li Shuo already uh, uh, mentioned that, but beyond uh, being uh, more aligned with climate objectives, is there also a demand or are there, are there players uh, asking for uh, the fact that this modernization plan would be also more oriented towards biodiversity protection, ocean protection. So um, I repeat my, my questions. The sensitivity of consumers to this ecology, to this greening, uh, the uh, issue of social resilience and employment and the social needs, and third, uh, environmental issues beyond biodiversity. Uh, sure, maybe you want to go first because that's something you already tackled, but maybe that gives you some more space to... to, to uh, to elaborate. Uh, sure, happy, happy to. Uh, it's you know th those are difficult uh, difficult questions, uh, but uh, but a few things that I can say. Um, n number one, I, I do think there is a need, and there will be space for um, you know a conversation on um, consumption pattern from from the Chinese consumers. I, I think to some extent. Uh, that that opportunity has already been uh, in front of us. Uh, this um, uh, is is also you know uh, one way to uh, I, I guess make the the green agenda relevant to the general public. Um, uh, you know, over the last few years, um, some of the environmental organizations in China have already engaged with with this topic. As, as you know, many of your participants may know, uh, you know, e-commerce has been uh, a, a, a very important uh, sector in China, um, and, and, and I think a lot of work needs to be done in 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 that uh, in that area. Um, you mentioned um, uh, biodiversity. Uh, my my personal opinion is. Um, uh, the progress there will primarily be reflected in um, the reform of our wildlife management system. Uh, this, this includes uh, 
the amendment of our wildlife uh, 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 protection law. Um, there will be, I don't want to go into the nitty gritties of, of that, uh, that uh, amendment uh, forces, but let me just say the biggest political issue there is about how do we approach, how do we uh, view wildlife and nature uh, in principle. The traditional approach, and this uh, to some extent was, was precisely how we got where we are now, is uh, we, we, we tend to put utilization uh, in front of conservation. Uh, and now I think there is a re rethinking uh, in terms of how we rebalance this, these two concepts. Should we emphasize protection more than the use of wildlife? And in addition to that, uh, uh, in addition to a, a kind of a species uh, uh, oriented or species specific approach, um, can we also have more emphasis on general protection on habitat, um, you know, and uh, and protected areas? Uh, so again, I think I think this will be an, a very interesting space to watch. Uh, not only because this this might be uh, a, a big an area which will uh, in a way benefit it uh, from from COVID nineteen, but also uh, it will be intellectually an interesting area because the amendment won't necessarily be easy. There there are difficult intellectual questions. There are also livelihood of people. You know, in, in terms if you think about the breeding industry, uh, trying to breed a lot of wildlife. Uh, in animal farms, how do we deal with that? And that also speaks back to uh, sort of the just transition idea brought up by some of the participants. Over. Thank you very much. Just to mention that we tried to organize uh, another webinar specifically on the prospects for biodiversity globally seen from China uh, in, the, in, the coming, in the coming weeks with Li Shuo again accepting to participate. So that's for the participants who really are interested in the in the in following up in that conversation you would you want to to complement things on, on this uh, maybe on the social dimension i don't know if that's something that rings a bell mm. I, don't, I don't really have the answers to your questions but they can bring some elements um, one of the uh, social challenges uh, if we can call it that way that china is facing is um, an urgent need of urbanization so there will be almost, uh, I think the numbers are around 300 million people that will move from the campaigns to um, cities or um, maybe not the largest cities, but middle-sized cities. And uh, this uh, huge urbanization over the, the next decade, and this huge urbanization brings a lot of challenges, but uh, also opportunities. And uh, we feel that, um, there is something there uh, that uh, the Chinese government has to do. It has to take care of that uh, to build the new cities and the, the infrastructures in the buildings. And, and uh, there is an opportunity to bring in uh, like um, higher quality buildings, higher quality installations, but also renewable energy into new urban areas. And also develop the urban planning. We talked about uh, electric vehicles before and where to put the chargers. And th th these kind of things all come together. And in China, uh, we have to realize that it's uh, very much a country still in the development in uh, a large area of it. And so um, there's, uh, a, 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 I'm not sure, uh, I really don't know of the social concern and um, the, the priorities about that. But I know that there is a population change and um, this will be a, a huge factor into uh, the direction that China is going to. In, in terms of consumers, that also applies. As I mentioned before, the Chinese population is aging and uh, there's a, you know, a large now middle, middle class that um, is uh, calling for more uh, quality of life, air quality, and uh, prevention from pollution, but also health. And so uh, that creates opportunities. And um, if there's no, if there's still a limited awareness of the climate uh, uh, risk right now among the general population, I think it's fair to say that uh, there is still opportunities to work on 
the issues like air quality that are concomitant to climate and on which uh, the general public is really aware and willing to, uh, to, 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 to talk about and to address. Yeah, over. Thank you very much. Uh, we actually have only seven minutes left and a lot of questions on the, on the international scale that you've already come back to. I think one of the key questions that, is, that are there is first, lots of participants saying the world is actually so fragmented and actually going in the, in the, in the trend of fragmentation rather than cooperation. And, and I don't know if you could react to that in general, seeing how you, how you see that from China and the prospects for China to try and be one of the champions of cooperation. You, you've mentioned the new Bretton Woods, etc. So there, there, you said that there is, there is a space for China, but do you see that there is also a possibility now for China to, to try and be one of the champions or the, the, the champion? But the, and, and, and then there is also another particularly the question between EU and China. Uh, there was this EU-China Leipzig summit uh, foreseen in September, but at the same time, a lot of trust issues between China and the EU. So uh, again, you've said there is a space, political space, there is a need for that cooperation, but do you have any reaction on the fact that it might be actually difficult? But the most important types of questions are about globalization and the vision of China for globalization. Uh, very concretely, uh, some questions are asking what, 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 what is going to be the future of the Belt and Road Initiative? Uh, how do you see uh, the fact that for the moment the Belt and Road Initiative was very much on infrastructures in third countries with a lot of uh, uh, carbon intensive uh, uh, investments, uh, if I see some, some, some recent reports. Uh, so is this is this um, is this going to be? Uh, how do you see? Do you, do you have any prospects on the Belt and Road Initiative? And um, the, the the more complicated question that we have, because seen from Europe, there is a lot of uh, uh, citizens' demand for getting going more local in our in our in our value chains and not depending so much on China um, and on the rest of the world. And it's not it's not an anti-Chinese uh, feeling. It's just uh, being more resilient by going more local. If, that's not completely sure that it's true, but that's a demand that exists. And, and, that, and given the, the, the fact that China has been relying a lot on globalization to, for its growth and, and its strategy to reduce poverty, um, is there any way that the, the vision of China for the globalization of the future might be different than from that it was before the crisis? Again, lots of questions. Uh, we have a very, a very small amount of time, but uh, I give you each uh, Three to five minutes, uh, and sorry if we over, we will go further than uh, uh, the time foreseen by a few minutes. Maybe you, you would go first. Mm. So I can try. I'm sorry. So basically, I see there's really a lot of very interesting questions, but unfortunately, um, there's just so much we don't know, and uh, the crisis is still very new, and uh, the changes uh, are still very new. So. A lot of my answers will actually be uh, more on the wishful thinking side and what we should do, uh, especially from our, uh, the civil society point of view, uh, uh, in terms of cooperation. So um, yes, of course, uh, the, the Bell and Road Initiative is a big question. Um, they has been concerned about uh, the, uh, the carbon impact uh, of that. And um, we feel that, uh, I think personally the, the, the first uh, uh, reaction would be that China would have uh, less uh, um, finances to invest into that. And um, maybe there's uh, even a need for um, third party financing. And this is something where I believe that uh, the European Union could, could come into and build new cooperation with China. So there's, there are actually a lot of things where China and the EU are agreeing on uh, on the Belt and Road Initiative and, and some of uh, on the development uh, in uh, the countries on the road and um, on bringing uh, infrastructures to get people out of poverty. And uh, I think that um, uh, if um, there is a dialogue that could be set between EU and China uh, on uh, how to coordinate uh, development in those countries, there's definitely uh, opportunities and uh, and uh, and chances to actually even uh, move China and not China in a more climate friendly direction. On the fragmentation of uh, multilateralism, this is definitely something that 
uh, that uh, that uh, that we have seen. Uh, there has been some. Um, uh, uh, blames uh, shifting uh, going on uh, on the virus issue, but also even before that, uh, and the world was was very much more fragmented than even uh, five years ago for the Paris uh, Agreement. So um, there, uh, it, it's something that uh, I think that we need to really use this opportunity to 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 as a wake up call for more multilateralism, and because this is this is the only way out. Um, I, I think I'll, I'll probably uh, leave that to Lichro, um if uh, he wants to compliment some. Thank you very much, Lichro, please. Yeah, uh, again, thanks a lot for, for all these very good questions. Uh, I used the post, uh, uh, what were water analogy, uh, but, I, but I think one thing, not, uh, you know, that is, that is different from, uh, you know, after World War II is, uh, you know, if we are going to redesign the global system or, or, or modify the global system, um, this will not be done only by a few European countries and the United States, and back then, uh, uh, of course, uh, also the Soviet Union. Uh, now we we have um, uh, probably a, a more difficult, more challenging question in terms of how do we accommodate the interests of China, uh, and also conversely. Uh, what role should China play in shaping or leading uh, the uh, the redesign? And I, I have to admit, I don't have the answer to that question. But I think this is going to be the question uh, that uh, we need to we need to grapple with. I think everybody would agree that um, we are uh, really seeing a historical moment in in many different regards. Certainly, uh, you know, in terms of the future shape of international uh, system. I also agree that um, there there is a lot of fragmentation, which is not favorable for um, you know some of the visions that we uh, are, are advocating for. Um, and and there is there is tremendous trust deficit uh, in in international uh, diplomacy. Um, but let me let me just just say one thing, one, one personal observation over the past few months. It you know the, the 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 problem the challenging politics and diplomacy doesn't have to be that way, as we as we see over the past few months, uh, we are really talking about saving lives, and we one thing that I think everybody observed was bad diplomacy, uh, is it could really be harmful, even when the the interests of countries are aligned. So I do see that there is a role for better diplomacy uh, to bring countries together, to actually help them realize that sometimes their interests are not too far apart uh, from, uh, from each other. Um, and and, and, and I, think, I think this, this point also relates to the globalization uh, question that was, that was raised. I think China definitely benefited a lot from globalization over the past two decades. Uh, and, and, and this, this is something that China definitely appreciates. Uh, and I hope that could be a source for China to contribute more in terms of, uh, you know, uh, uh, designing or shaping uh, the future order of, of globalization. Thanks. Thanks very much for your, for your answers. I think it's really time to uh, leave you to your normal evening in, uh, in Beijing. Fei Chang CSCA, thank you very, very much. An extreme thank for, for you too, Li Shuo, uh, Dong Yue. I, I noticed from all the questions that people have been very interested by you giving us a, an insight into uh, both uh, how Chinese people or the Chinese uh, players, the civil society, the governments are reacting to the crisis and also some capacity to look into the future, which was, of course, never a forecast but a very useful way to to think about possible scenarios so very much many many thanks to you um, thanks also to uh, those who made that uh, webinar possible i see uh, brigitte karin um, max all the the comms team at ibri who's been very helpful for that um, thank you again for having mobilized uh, to the two speakers and thank for all the participants who have joined at some point, we were 292 people, uh, so that was something where 
uh, I think your your um, your questions and answers have been really shared uh, among a, a, an interesting community of people. Thank you again to you all. Uh, we just uh, uh, as a kind of advertising, we have other seminars uh, in uh, the foreseen. As I said, one is going to be next week on the on the question, the scientific question on the pandemics and biodiversity degradation. Uh, and uh, that's going to be next Thursday also. Uh, and we also plan, but still uh, need to, to specify the date, something about uh, biodiversity negotiations globally and the role of China. And we will come back to you with that information. Thanks again. Uh, have a good night in Beijing uh, and a good afternoon for those who are in Europe. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sebastian. Uh, all our best wishes for all of you for the next Thank month. You. Yeah. Thank, Thank you, everybody. You. Stay healthy. Thank you, Shul. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.